I guess we need help. And what best help to get than science? Because, well, human behavior must have a reason. We do not just behave because we want to threaten each other, which is quite common in the world. So, to understand the science behind that, we brought help. We have someone here who is a PhD in psychology. He's an expert in behaviorism. He was published in over 25 scientific journals. He authored and co-authored three significant books in behaviorism. And now he's here to tell us how we act to save the world. Please welcome Dr. Eric Schlinger. Skinner's article, Why We Are Not Acting to Save the World. 
I know Jacques met Skinner uh, at one time, I believe. They at least communicated. Um, and Skinner wrote throughout his life um, often about what is wrong with culture and how we can change human behavior. But later in his life, Skinner became pessimistic. And I'm going to talk about why he became pessimistic. And there's an irony to his pessimism, even though for much of his life he was very much the optimist. I'm going to, going to talk a little bit about what behavior science is, otherwise known as behavior analysis. I'm going to address the question of why we behave. And finally, I'm going to talk about behavior analysis or behavior science and the good life. That is, can we achieve the vision that Jacques and Roxanne and many of us in this room have for a, a sustainable future? So, the title of my talk is, Can We Act to Save the World? Well, one question we want to ask is, what do we mean by the world? This is not what we mean by the world. This world will be doing just fine. That's what we mean by the world. So we're very, people are, are they waving to themselves? People are, people are very, we're very egocentric and arrogant, uh, with good reason, I'll, I'll explain a little bit why. As the great social philosopher George Carlin stated, <laughs> the planet has been through a lot worse than us, been through earthquakes, volcanoes, plate tectonics, continental drift, solar flares, sunspots, magnetic storms, magnetic reversal of the poles, hundreds of thousands of years of bombardment by comets and asteroids and meteors, worldwide floods, tidal waves, worldwide fires, erosion, cosmic rays, recurring ice ages, and we think some plastic bags and aluminum cans are going to make a difference. The planet isn't going anywhere. We are. We're going away. Pack your shit, folks. We're going away, and we won't leave much of a trace either. Maybe a little styrofoam. The planet will be here and we'll be long gone. Just another failed mutation, just another closed-end biological mistake, an evolutionary cul-de-sac. The planet will shake us off like a bad case of fleas. By the way, I for one miss George Carl. But I have to admit that, um, like George and Skinner later in his life, uh, I'm not optimistic. I'm pessimistic and somewhat cynical. But that doesn't mean that I don't have a little ray of optimism, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And there are two things, maybe three things, that give me a ray of optimism. Um, one is the behavior science that I'm schooled in, because I believe if everyone understood it, and I don't mean just everyone in this room, but I mean everyone, then we might be able to use it to change our behavior to save ourselves from ourselves. The second ray of optimism comes from Jacques and Roxanne and the Venus Project, because I see in what they've done, um, as Abby mentioned, a window by which we can hopefully open up and let in some fresh air and change things. And the third, I don't have a picture of him, but the third is my five-year-old son. Um, and whatever pessimism or cynicism I had uh, lessened considerably when he was born, and every day that I spend with him lessens even more. So partly I do it for him. Now, I mentioned Skinner. Um, I can't think of a single psychologist or maybe intellectual in the past 100 years that's been more misrepresented and misunderstood than you have Skinner. So it's not my job to rectify that, but I want to talk about the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, he had, for decades, addressed the same issues that the Venus Project has addressed. First, in his novel Walden II, which was published in 1948. Now, in Walden II, Skinner, it was a fictional, it's a novel, so it's fictionalized, Skinner designed a community based on behavioral principles. And many people called it a utopian community, but it really wasn't a utopian community. It was an experimental community. And there's a big difference. Because as Skinner wrote in his book, practices were not immutable. Practices were seen to be changed if they needed to be changed. One of the problems with our culture is that we have no way by which to assess whether what we do works or not. And so we keep doing the same stuff over and over again, especially the stuff that doesn't work. So an emphasis on experimentation was critical. In 1982, he wrote an article, which I mentioned, titled, Why We Are Not Acting to Save the World. I'm going to talk about that article. In 1985, he wrote an article titled, What is Wrong with Daily Life in the Western World? And much of which he cited as being wrong 
Jacques and Roxanne and others in this room have also talked about. By then, by the way, he was beginning to be pessimistic. So I want to talk a little bit about his article because I don't need to reinvent the wheel. We know that there are a lot of problems caused by human behavior. And by the way, let me just say this, because I'll mention this several times. The problems aren't with the human mind, they're not with human will, they're not with human motivation. Those things are not real things. Those things are made up constructs. The problem is with what we actually do. So, these aren't all of them, these are just three of the main ones. Overpopulation is obviously a huge problem. As a result of that, we are exhausting our critical resources, the ones that we would need for a resource-based economy. And as a result, the Earth grows steadily less habitable for humans and for many other species. So why are we not doing more? Especially since we've made extraordinary progress in all kinds of scientific technology, space exploration, genetic engineering, electronic technology. Well, what are some traditional explanations for why we are not doing more? I already mentioned that. People say we're not doing more because we lack resolve. We lack the will. Somebody in the video said that, I think. Or we're just not motivated. But you see, those aren't real things. Those are not scientific concepts. You can't find willpower or resolve or motivation. Those are words that we made up, right? So traditional explanations, while they sound good and they match with the way we've been raised, which is we've all been raised as Cartesian dualists, they match the way we've been raised, so we don't really question them. But of course, they can't be good, good explanations because they haven't solved any problems. So here are some problems Skinner side. A minor one is, how do we affect a future that isn't here? That's, that's not really unresolvable because the future is now and then the future is now. So we, that's, but this is a more difficult one. How could we be affected by a future that isn't here? You can tell people all kinds of bad stuff that's going to happen as a result of climate change or as a result of other things. But telling them about it, the future is not here, it cannot come back into the past and affect the present. That's a very difficult problem. Skinner also mentioned the fact that we are hostages to our genetic history. What did he mean by that? Well, I'm going to get a little bit more technical. What he meant is that evolution has given us susceptibilities to be reinforced by things which in the short run are very pleasant and pleasurable, in the long run they're very detrimental. There's a few. <laughs> Obviously, in our evolutionary history, we needed salt. We needed sugar, right? We needed sex if we wanted to pass on our genes. Harm to others obviously evolved, just as it does in many other species, to protect young, to guard against predators, etc. The drugs part is a, little, is a little different because we've evolved certain receptor sites in the brain that are sensitive to external agents, but they're also caused, they're also uh, stimulated by internal agents. So what's the problem with these things? The problem is a problem which I'll come back again and talk about, and that is the difference between immediate versus remote consequences. The immediate consequence of, con of ingesting sugar or salt or having sex or doing drugs or even hurting somebody are very powerful reinforcers. That means we will engage in the same behavior to produce those things. I don't need to convince you all of that. You all like your chocolate, you like your salty stuff, I assume you like your sex, and uh, those of you who ingest drugs, you probably like those too. <laughs> this is a serious problem. This is a serious problem because in order to solve problems related to these things, we need to bring remote consequences to be more immediate. That's a very difficult problem to solve. So, what are some traditional solutions? By the way, when I use the word traditional, that means not good, okay? <laughs> warn people of the potential consequences. This is what we do all the time. We warn people of the potential consequences. By the way, this is what parents do with little kids. And, by the way, it doesn't work. Okay? And then, as an alternative, we give them advice about what to do instead. Don't run out into the street and play. Rather, play in the front yard. Okay? I hear see parents doing this with three-year-old kids. The three-year-old kid has no clue what the parent's talking about. This doesn't work with kids, it doesn't work with adults. Maybe a few adults, but most, most adults it doesn't work with. So we obviously need another solution. As Dr. Phil says, 
How's that working for you? <laughs> I don't watch Dr. Phil, but I do like this one because it's not working. Now, just like Jacques and others in this room, Abby, for instance, a few minutes ago, Skinner called out governments, religions, and capitalistic systems. But Skinner pointed out from a scientific perspective that those systems, too, have evolved and been selected. They're not the result of some mad genius or madman somewhere. These systems meet out both negative and positive consequences in our culture. For example, money and goods, those are immediate reinforcers that these systems use to induce people to work for a future beyond their own. But it's not a future of us, it's a future for business and industry. Their justification is said to be, well, you have more abundant production and distribution of stuff. And as Gabby pointed out and others, you know, we like our stuff. Without those so-called justifications, governments, religions, and capitalistic systems would not be able to maintain their control. However, suppose the futures of governments, religions, and capitalistic systems were congruent with the future of the species, well, we wouldn't be here today, would we? Our problems would be solved, because they have the, the resources and where we're called to do that. But it doesn't behoove them. I mean, it doesn't behoove us or them, for that matter, to do that. This is from Skinner. Governments, religions, and capitalistic systems, whether public or private, control most of the reinforcements of daily life. They must use them as they have always done, for their own aggrandizement. And they have nothing to gain by relinquishing power. Those institutions are the embodiments of cultural practices that have come into existence through selection. I'll talk about what that means in a second. But the contingencies of selection for those systems are not congruent with or in conflict with the future of the species. So let me talk about what he means by selection. Skinner wrote an article called Selection by Consequence. Um, the first kind of selection by consequences is biological evolution. Obviously, in biological evolution, when individuals come into the world with traits that are beneficial in a given environment, then they live long enough to pass on those traits to their offspring. That's how genes evolve. The term selection refers to the fact that living long enough to pass on your genes selects those genes for future generations, assuming the environment doesn't change. Skinner, who was one of the main discoverers of operant conditioning, <coughs> applied this metaphor of selection to the individual. So the individual's behavior is also selected by its consequences. Every time you behave, it produces a consequence. Now, I'm not using the word consequence the way my dad used it when I was growing up. Like, if you don't behave, you're going to get the consequence. I just mean anything that behavior produces, all the products of behavior. I can't, I, if I had more time with you, I could convince you of this, but I'll just tell you now. Every single thing you do your entire life is consequences. And those consequences determine whether you continue to do those things or whether you don't continue in a very simple way. The third level of selection, of the metaphor of selection, has to do at the cultural level. So when we talk about governments, religions, capitalistic systems, they have evolved culturally. There's a hint of it in, in, the, in the documentary, but obviously they have evolved and they've been selected for. The contingencies that have been created are favorable for those things to continue. So in our effort to think about how to change that, we need to think about what are the cultural contingencies for those institutions. So possible solutions. Well, if Skinner's solution is turned to science, the same as Jacques and Roxanne. Skinner believes that we need to find scientists who are uncommitted to governments and religions. Now, there are some who are committed to them, but many are not. For Skinner, scientists can give us the best picture of the future. And in fact, we're living it right now because climatologists and climate scientists are giving us a very accurate picture of what the future will be like, because the future is here. You live in, many of you, not all of you, many of you live in Florida, and you know that in the, by the year 2100, you're gonna have to move. Florida's going to be underwater. It's already underwater. I live in California. We need your water. <laughs> so we already, the future is already here with respect to that. For Skinner, however, the scientists that we need to turn to are behavioral scientists. So I'm here to tell you that we already have the science needed to design a world that will take our genetic nature into account, whatever that genetic nature is, and correct many of the miscarriages of evolution. It's called behavior science, also known as behavior analysis. 
Now, Skinner also pointed out that you can't simply impose a new system on the world. You can't impose things on the world. That will produce counter control and resistance. Nor could any new alternative escape selection by consequences either. Because any new practice that we install would appear as a variation only to survive if it contributed to the strength of the group. So keeping in mind this notion of selection. Now Skinner ended his article with a story. Here's our story. If the evidence survives, visitors from outer space may someday reconstruct a curious story. The Earth was a small planet, but it proved suitable for life. At some point, atoms came together in a molecule that, under just the right circumstances, reproduced itself. Random variations in the structure of that molecule made reproduction possible under less favorable circumstances. Cells evolved and then organs, organisms and species. Interchanges with the environment became more and more complex. In one species, Homo sapiens, the vocal musculature came under opera control, and people began to talk to each other and exchange experiences. Elaborate cultural practices evolved, among them science and technology. Unfortunately, they were used to support genetic dispositions that had evolved at an earlier stage. Because food was reinforcing, people raised, stored, and distributed vast quantities of it. Because moving about was useful and exciting, they invented trains, cars, airplanes, and spaceships. Because good things could be taken from other people and then needed to be defended, they invented clubs, guns, and bombs. Because they wished to avoid ill health and the threat of death, they practiced medicine and sanitation. They lived longer and their numbers increased, and they took over more and more of the earth and brought it under cultivation. They consumed more and more of its irreplaceable resources. In the struggle for what was left, they began to build weapons so powerful that they could bring life to, on earth to an end. Perhaps you can understand why Skinner became pessimistic later in his life. But he did offer two possible solutions, two possible endings to the story. Here's the first one. This is the more pessimistic one. A few people saw the danger and worried about it, but their proposals conflicted with the practices that were supported not only by immediate and hence more powerful consequences, but by the out-of-date moral and ethical principles that had been intended to justify them. Here's the more optimistic ending. Those who saw the danger began to study human behavior with the methods of science. They turned from observing what people had done up to that time to observing what people did under carefully controlled conditions, that is, experimentation. A science and a technology of behavior emerged. Better cultural practices were designed. And the species survived for many thousands of years. I left that part. Now, the author Paul Chance in 2007 noted that toward the end of his life and career, B.F. Skinner became pessimistic about our ability to use behavior science to solve the problems facing us. Now, why was that ironic? It's ironic because he's the one who helped develop the behavior science, and it's the thing that made him most optimistic throughout most of his career. It's hard to imagine, but he discovered that you can get organisms to behave exactly as you want them to by arranging their environment. That's got to have been a very powerful thing for someone to see. And once you see that, you think, oh my gosh, can't we should be able to apply this culture-wide and get people to change their behavior. So, there's the iron. Now, I want to just list five of these things. Um, five of the aspects of behavior science that Skinner helped discover that made him pessimistic. The first one I've already mentioned, that is, immediate consequences outweigh delayed or remote consequences. Um, this is perhaps the big one. Um, we all behave for the immediate consequences of our behavior, all of us. Um, very few of us behave for remote consequences, and when we do, it means that others have made other immediate consequences contingent on the behavior so that we can uh, reap the ultimate consequences. So, for example, if you eat bad food, high in cholesterol, high in fat, high in sugar, whatever, then you run the risk of developing serious conditions. But you might have a group or parents or friends who reinforce healthier eating on your part. Now, the healthier eating, for the most part, is not as tasty as the bad eating. But you don't do it for the, for the good taste. You do it because you have a group around you that reinforces that. If someone tells you, you know, if you keep eating that, eating that chocolate cake and those cookies, you know, you might get diabetes. 
Well, when's the diabetes? First of all, it's not probable. It's not 100% probable, so you might not get it. You know the old, the old story, my granddaddy smoked three packs of cigarettes till he was 100 and... <laughs> yeah, well that's true for, for very few people, but most people who smoke three packs of cigarettes aren't around to talk about it. But it's, it's a remote consequence. Okay? So this is probably the most powerful thing. If we're going to redesign the culture, we need to find other consequences that can mediate that delay. Consequences for the individual outweigh consequences for others. We are selfish individuals. We are genetically selfish. You are here, not for any purpose in the future. You are here, well, I'll tell you a story. My mother, she doesn't ask me these questions anymore, but she's, she said to me, why am I here? What's my purpose? And I said, well, mom, you really want to know? So you're here because your parents had sex. <laughs> No, that's not what I mean. I mean, what's my purpose? I said, well, you know, Mom, you've already served your purpose. You've, you've reproduced yourself three times, okay? So that's not what she meant, obviously. That's why she doesn't ask me these questions anymore. Anyway. <laughs> but consequences for the individual outweigh the consequences for the others. If you're going to redesign a culture, you need to redesign it so that people behave we're all going to behave selfishly, but we need to behave so that what reinforces us also benefits us. There are people, there are plenty of people who do that, but many people who don't. Coincidental events often strengthen ineffective behavior. Prayer is a good example. Now, we all know, I think, in this room that prayer doesn't do what people think it does, right? But sometimes people pray, and very, very occasionally, the thing they pray for comes to pass. And they go, see? I prayed that she would live, and she lived. She had faith, you know, terminal cancer, and the doctor gave up hope, and I prayed, and, she, and somehow it happened. So my prayer was important. Of course, they never remembered the thousands of other times they prayed, and nothing came to pass. But the problem is that these are coincidental events that people ascribe meaning to. Susceptibility to social reinforcement can incline us toward extreme views. At, at a picture of Donald Trump, I was wondering a month ago when I started working on this talk whether I would be able to use him as an example, and I'm sorry to say that I am able to do that. Is Donald Trump really an evil fascist? I don't think so. Donald Trump says stuff, and he has for a long time. The more ridiculous, outlandish, crazy, provocative stuff he says, the more the people cheer. And of course the media also contributes to it as well. I guarantee you if he got up in a room like this and no one was here, he wouldn't talk that way. If no one paid attention to him, he would stop talking. So, and he's just an example, right? We have plenty of examples of people with extreme views, and their extreme views aren't because they're bad or evil or whatever, it's because they get attention for it. And finally, the use of aversive control tends to reinforce the behaviors who use it, the, the, behavior, the behavior of people who use it. Whenever a parent uses aversive control, which means threats, you know, it's punishment, to get kids to behave, the parent's behavior is reinforced because the kid behaves. So we need to design a culture or a world where using that kind of control does not reinforce the people who use it. So is there hope, or is there even time? The only hope that Skinner held out was winning over a substantial number of influential people, educators, writers, journalists, scientists, and scholars, who might then pressure policymakers to take effective action. But um, as uh, the bleak view that that uh, Abby gave us, that's obviously not going to happen. And the fact that we have failed in doing so is perhaps even further support for Skinner's view and for his pessimism. But I want to tell you, as I told you before, the more we know about behavior science, the more likely it is we can change. So let me talk about what behavior science is. Before I do that, let me talk about some problems standing in the way of accepting behavior science. And now I'm talking more to you directly, I think. Because even though you all, we all share a vision in this room, we all grew up in the same culture that taught us about behavior. First, we all think we know and understand behavior. I have a PhD in psychology. I have three degrees in psychology. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I've published experimental work with non-humans, with kids, with adults. I've written theoretical articles in a variety of different journals. I've published three books. I'm invited to talk all over the world. I'm not bragging. I'm telling you that when I am in, in, in a conversation with somebody about human behavior and they ask my opinion, which is an educated opinion, I hazard to say, 
they frequently go, well, I don't agree with you. Or if that's your opinion. Now imagine if I were an astrophysicist and someone asked me about the recent discovery of gravitational waves predicted by Einstein's, Einstein's theory. And I told them, and they said, oh, well, that's cool, that's your opinion. I don't think that's what really happened. <laughs> Nobody would do that. <clears throat> but when you're an expert on human behavior, everybody's equal. Everybody's a psychologist. I'm sure you all know this. And I don't even have to tell people what I do to hear about it. Why is that? Because nobody pretends to be an expert in chemistry, physics, or biology. We all pretend to be experts in maybe the thing that's more complicated. First, we all behave. We seem to have intimate and personal knowledge of our own behavior. If you ask somebody why she or he did something, she can sort of introspect and look at what she was thinking or whatever and tell you that. Also, we've been told things about behavior ever since we could talk. The culture teaches us through our parents about behavior. One of those things is we have free will. <coughs> I spoke at a skeptics conference in 2005. Now, skeptics, I thought were skeptical. And, uh, but I discovered that they're only skeptical of obvious things like UFOs and astrology and stuff like that. The stuff that I'm skeptical about, they're not skeptical about because they all believe in free will. But we've been told that we have free will. We've been told that we can make our own decisions and are responsible for our own behavior. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Obviously, because I'm telling you this, it means I disagree with all of this. As I said, compare this to physics, chemistry, and biology. Nobody who, who doesn't have a degree in those things would ever pretend to be an expert, and yet we're all experts in human behavior. This is one of the hurdles that people like me have to contend with. So what is behavior science? Behavior science, behavior analysis, is a natural science, just like chemistry, physics, and biology. It's concerned with the description, prediction, and understanding of behavior. Not mental events, behavior, in its own right, I'll explain that in a minute, as a function of environmental variables and based on quantitative empirical evidence, that is experimentation. Now there are three assumptions in behavior science that I uh, just want to go over briefly. Um, and by the way, these are assumptions that, that contradict the way many of us were raised. The first one is physicalism, which basically says everything in the universe is physical. And you might go, yeah, I, I agree with that. But you see, you were all raised as dualists. That is, you believe you have minds and bodies. Some of you think your mind is your brain, but most of you think your mind is something else. Some kind of intangible, non-material thing that, that makes you do things. And we have all kinds of expressions in our vocabulary that talk about the mind. In my mind, I was doing, well, where is that? Was that like next to your bathroom? In my mind? You know? Explanations of behavior then have to point to physical events. They can't point to mental events. Number two, determinism. The assumption of determinism is that behavior is lawful and orderly, and it's caused by physical events. Now, a lot of people go, well, behavior can't be lawful and orderly because we're all different. Well, snowflakes are all different, too, and yet the causes of snowflakes are exactly the same, okay? So the fact that we behave differently doesn't mean that the causes of our behavior are different. That contradicts the notion of free will, by the way. And as I tell my students, who all believe in free will, at least until they have me, they say, well, yeah, I, I believe that some of my behavior is determined, and some of it I, I can choose freely. You know what I tell them? You've got to pick a side. It's like being pregnant. You can't say, I'm kind of pregnant. It's like, you're either pregnant or you're not. It's just black or white, right? You have to pick a side. I've picked my side. It's what is determinism. My students, not so sure. Explanations of behavior, then, must not only point to physical events, they must also point to those laws that have been discovered. The third assumption is one called parsimony. That is, descriptions and explanations of behavior must make the fewest assumptions. Explanations, then, must be parsimonious. One of my favorite examples, a child throwing a tantrum. I'm assuming you've all seen children throw tantrums in stores on multiple occasions. Maybe some of you were those children. Maybe some of you still throw tantrums. So here's a child who throws a tantrum. The parent takes the child into the store. The child says, I want candy. The parent says, no. The child starts screaming and crying and throwing things. So you go up to three people and you say, why is that child doing that? Person number one says, well, it's obvious. She's, obvious. She's possessed by demons. <laughs> and those demons made her, making her do that. 
And so you go to person number two, and that person says, no, 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 that's not it. Her id is so powerful that her poor weak ego can't stand it, and the superego was never developed, so she's just completely id dominated. You all didn't laugh as much at that one. And yet that one is no better than the evil spirits. And the third person goes, no, no, she tantrums because she gets candy. Now, a parsimonious description or explanation must point to the fewest assumptions. The one of those explanations that makes the fewest assumptions is the one that says she tantrums because she gets candy. The other ones make assumptions, many assumptions. Now, can we prove that she's not possessed by demons? No. Can we prove that her id is overpowering her ego? No. Can we prove the candy causes her tantrum? Yes. I've done it lots of times with parents. And the reason you can prove it is because the candy is physical and the tantrum is physical. They're both observable. You can do something about them. What are the traditional views about why we behave? I'm sure many of you still hold this. Behavior comes from within you. We behave because of what we think, feel, want, wish, decide, intend, and desire. Or because of certain traits we have, like intelligence, aggression, shyness, creativity, integrity. Or because of our genes and our brains. Hopefully after today you will be at least question these, these notions. By the way, these things, these are, they're just words. Intelligence, uh, integrity, shine, they're just words. They don't exist anywhere. If you say she does something because she's intelligent, as Jacques said, show me the intelligence. It's just in her behavior that leads you to say she's intelligent. And again, we freely choose our own behavior. Some people go, I, I know I choose my own behavior, I don't believe it's free. But you don't even choose your own behavior. I call this a naive philosophy that many of us have. It's taught to us by our parents as kids, but then it's codified by the social sciences, psychology, sociology, criminal justice, etc. The culture buys in to these traditional views. And one of my points today is, as long as we continue to accept that behavior comes from within the, within the individual, we will never be able to figure out how to change our behavior in time to save ourselves. I've talked about explaining behavior. Most traditional explanations are faulty. I've given you a little example there. They're faulty because they point to mental or cognitive events and not physical events. If you want to explain behavior scientifically, you have to point to a physical event that can be observed. Okay? They don't point to laws of behavior, and they're not parsimonious. Because you might say, she scored really high on that test because she's so damn bright. And that sounds good, but that's no better than evil spirits or demons. Because you can't see the intelligence, and you can't see the evil spirits. You better find some other physical explanation for why she does well in school versus somebody else. Scientific explanations, on the other hand, must point to physical events that can be observed independently of the behavior. Genes, by the way, would constitute physical events that can be observed independent of behaviors. And it's certainly true that genes contribute to our behavior. But gene, there is no single gene for individual behaviors. The Human Genome Project, before it came out, people thought, well, they're going to find humans have millions of genes because we've always thought we were the best and the brightest on the planet. We must have the most genes. Guess how many genes we have? Anybody know? About 26,000. That's pretty humbling. <laughs> Now, those 26,000 genes do pretty incredible things. Wheat has more genes than humans does. Humans do. But genes are certainly physical and observable, so they would constitute at least part of a scientific explanation. People nowadays like to talk about the brain. Mostly people who have no clue about the brain. Very few people who know about the brain talk this way, but we all oh, my amygdala was, you know, kind of acting up, and all the, the you know, the executive function was like, what are you talking about? You know, are you a neuroscientist? No. But it is true that the brain is a physical event, and there's no question that the brain mediates every single thing we do. That's the only thing that we have that's completely accessible, observable, and changeable without an incredible technology, and we can do it right now, the environment. So, what's the behavior analytic view about why we behave? First of all, we study behavior in its own right. In other words, 
it's not an index or a reflection of a mental event or a cognitive event or, or a, a feelings or anything like that. You take what you got. Right? Now that's not to say that all behavior is observable. Some of it is unobserved, but we still consider it behavior. Behavior in its own right as caused by environmental events. This is an expression I like to give my students. You might recognize this as, a, as a, a paraphrase of an expression that Bill Clinton used in the 1992 presidential election. I don't need to give the whole story, some of you are old enough to remember, but the expression was, it's the economy student. So I paraphrased it, it's the environment student, because it is. It's the environment that, result, that, that caused you to have the genes you have, it's your evolutionary environment, and it's your learning environment from the time you were born that produced the behavior that you have. The main law that behavior science uses is something called the law of effect, or reinforcement. That's as, the most succinct, parsimonious description I can give. Six words. Behavior is determined by its consequences. I mentioned this earlier. Everything you do produces a consequence. When I push the button correctly on this device here, and my slide progresses, then that reinforces my behavior. I'm likely to push the same button in the same way. If I accidentally push a different button and I lose it, then I'm less likely to do that. I don't determine whether I'm going to push the button. This determines whether I'm going to push the button correctly. And that's okay. I'm not depressed by that. I'm not depressed by giving over control of my behavior of button pushing to this device. <laughs> and by the way, the chair determines that you'll sit in it, and the water bottle determines that you'll twist the cap off and drink from it, and I can go on. So let me go back to the child throwing the tantrum. Because the child's behavior is determined by its consequences, and so is the parent. So just this is a brief little thing here. So here we have the child's behavior, and here we have the parent's behavior. I'm going to go over here so the child can see. This is very simplistic. But here we have the, the child is in the store with the parent. The child asks for candy, the parent says no. The child throws a tantrum. What does the child get? Candy. Okay. Now, you might say, well, because I know how I feel about children like that in public. I hate those kids. <laughs> shut, shut that kid up. What's wrong with that kid? You know? You know what? There's nothing wrong with the kid. The kid is behaving exactly as she or he should be behaving. If you can only get food by tantruming, guess what? That's what you would do. And by the way, as long, if you think tantruming is something that all kids do, you're wrong. They don't. If you think it's something that's, that all stage all kids go through, you're wrong. If you take a kid and put them on a desert island all by themselves, they will never, ever tantrum. I'll let you think about why. <laughs> but there are two actors on the stage. That's the child's behavior. By the way, that stands for positively reinforcing consequence. That means the next time the child and parent are in the store, the child's going to do the exact same thing. The parent is in the store with the child, and the child starts tantrum. The parent do. They get candy. What do they get? Quiet. The child stops tantrum. So the parent and the child, you would predict, will do the same thing over and over again. And they do. And it gets worse between the two. Some of you may know. I don't need to tell you that. My point with this example is this. Both the parent and the child's behavior are completely determined by the consequence. I've worked with a lot of parents. Many of them have children who cry or tantrum in various places. And if you stop giving the child candy, guess what? The child will stop tantruming. Do you need to talk about what the child feels, what the child thinks, what the child expects? No. If you stop giving them the candy, they will stop tantruming. Sometimes parents ask me what to do with their little princess who comes home from preschool and says the F word. Because you know how parents react, right? Oh, don't say that's a bad word, right? Now, put, put, look at it from the child's perspective. Children like cartoons. They like dramatic things. So they come out with some word. They have no clue what it means. And what do they see you do? Behaving like a cartoon character. And guess what? They use it again and again. So I tell parents, if your child comes home from preschool, says a bad word, Pay it no attention. Well, how will they ever learn that it's not an appropriate word to say? Because they won't say it again if they don't get attention. That's how they learn. Parents have a hard time understanding that. Behavior is determined by its consequences. So, how can we achieve the good life? 
Well, I would have to say the natural sciences have done their share. Psychology has failed. Why has psychology made such little progress? One, a continued adherence to dualism. They still talk about mind and mentalism and cognitive events. I don't talk about them anymore. Do I use them in casual conversation? Sure, because I'm a human. Okay. But in scientific conversation, I make no mention of them. And they lack a true experimental methodology. As I mentioned earlier, and as I believe is implicit in the philosophy of the Venus Project, you have to have experimentation at all levels to figure out what works. In fact, all of the research centers that they've designed into the Venus Project, that's what they do. So there needs to be one for human behavior, a research center for human behavior. Behavior analysis, behavior science is the exception. It's not dualistic. We study behavior in and of itself. And it has already discovered laws of behavior. Now there's an applied branch of behavior analysis, which has already improved the lives of, mil of many people by offering practical solutions to many behavioral problems. And in a very simplistic way, by reducing problematic behaviors and increasing healthy, productive behaviors. Now, I'm not going to read this list. I'll just put it up. This is just from one volume of one of our journals. This is just a list of topics that have been changed by applying the laws of behavior. That's just in one volume of one journal. Now, if we're able to change all of those behaviors, and many, many more, then that's what gives me a little optimism that we might be able to apply it more culture-wide. But behavior analysis can be used even more widely in society to create conditions that will encourage people to flourish. What does it mean to flourish? It means to grow or develop in a healthy, vigorous way especially as a result of a particularly favorable environment. I'm going to go through this quickly because I've, I've probably overused my time. But here would be three simple steps in a behavior analytic approach to get people to flourish. First, you have to identify the behaviors that you want to, people to do. Um, and in other words, these are behaviors that would lead us to say that someone is virtuous or helpful or caring. Because helpful, caring, moral, those are just words. You can't observe them, right? But you can't observe the behaviors that lead us to say that people are helpful and caring. Describe the term, behaviors in terms that at least two people can observe. That makes it scientific. Second, create an environment to increase the likelihood of virtuous behavior. The technology derived from the science of applied behavior analysis involves altering individuals' environments to promote healthy, productive behaviors and to reduce unhealthy, unproductive ones. By the way, as I mentioned in the video, by environment, I don't mean the house you grew up in, the parents you have, the school you went to. I mean the, all the stimuli that affect your behavior at a given moment. That means your environment changes moment to moment. It means that your environment is inside you as well as outside you, because there are stimuli inside your body, like pain. It also means that no two people can have the same environment. Even if you're physically conjoined, identical twins, you cannot have the same environment. Now, the traditional notion of environment is much simpler, but it's also an ineffective one. This is a much more complicated one, but much more effective. Third step, use experimentation to confirm that behavior did in fact change. How often do you, you go to a therapist and you leave and you say, how are you doing? Oh, I think I'm doing better. You mean you don't know? No, I feel a little bit better, yeah. Right. Or you go to the chiropractor, which by the way, well, don't get me started on the chiropractor. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing good, I'm doing good. Do you have to go back next week? Oh yeah, I go every week. Well, what's the point, right? It's supposed to fix you, right? There should be some way of telling whether you are different or not, other than your own self-report. Experimentation is the hallmark of all sciences, including the science of behavior and its technological application. So here's a vision of the good life that we've already seen. It's just one vision. It seems like a good one to me. This is from my visit to the Venus Project. But the good life 
a life of virtuousness, a sustainable resource-based economy will not happen unless or until we understand why we do what we do and we can arrange environments to change what we do. That's why I think I'm here today and why I was included in the video. As Skinner said, either we do nothing and allow a miserable and probably catastrophic future to overtake us, or we use our knowledge about human behavior to create a social environment in which we shall live productive and creative lives and do so without jeopardizing the chances that those who follow us will be able to do the same. So I believe that between my five-year-old and the Venus Project and a behavior science, that we can actually begin to achieve that. Thank you very much.